Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Welcome to Hashing It Out, a podcast where we talk to the tech innovators behind blockchain infrastructure and decentralized networks. We dive into the weeds to get at why and how people build this technology and the problems they face along the way. Come listen and learn from the best in the business so you can join their ranks. Episode 35 of Hashing It Out. I am Dr. Corey Petty. 35? 35. 35. Is it not? Are we? Wasn't the last one 33? Pretty sure it was 34. Yeah, so, huh. Episode 3X of Hashing It Out. <laughs> Coming at you. We'll see which one it is whenever we put it in post production. Uh, as always, I'm Dr. Corey Petty, and my trusted co host is Colin Couchet. Say hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Nice. And today, uh, we are with JT and Sean from Storage, a decentralized file storage company. And they are coming out with a lot of really cool stuff lately in their newest release, is Storage. And we wanted to get them on to talk generally about the difficulties of decentralized file storage, as it's a um, something very interesting to Colin, and I've always found it fascinating and useful, uh, as well as kind of what their new features are and, and, and how they got there and where things are going. So welcome to the show, guys. You want to give yourselves a quick introduction as to who you are, how you got in the space, and what, what Storage is. Yeah, Sean first. Hey, uh, so I'm Sean Wilkinson, uh, founder of Storage. I uh, got involved in these fun Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in 2012 and fell in love. And uh, throughout my journey, I, I you know, explored different parts of the technology and just thought, hey, decentralized storage and kind of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain make sense together and kind of went down that, that rabbit hole. And uh, never came out. And at the end uh, was was storage, uh, which is a uh, decentralized and distributed um, uh, cloud storage platform uh, that allows anyone to uh, rent out their extra hard drive space. And on the other side, we allow uh, people to store data on this network. Uh, we're focused on developers, but they can do it a lot cheaper, a lot faster, and a lot quicker. Um, so and a lot more private and secure. So that's us. Well, that's me. Uh, and I'm JT. Uh, I uh, only joined Storage uh, just this year, so um, uh, I'm grateful to be able to join Sean on this. Um, previously, uh, I was one of the early engineers at Mosey, which was uh, an online backup company prior to, um, you know, really uh, people really believing that cloud storage was even a viable option. Um, uh, we kind of uh, helped push the narrative there at Mosey. Um, I also worked, uh, I interned at Google. Um, I worked at uh, Space Monkey, which was a kickstarted distributed storage platform with um, uh, uh, little home devices to compete with Dropbox. Um, and uh, that, that was sort of a, a six year journey after an acquisition into some other distributed storage platforms. Uh, and then I joined uh, Storage, yeah, just this year. So um, I kind of have, uh, um, I got early into cryptocurrency, but um, for the most part, my experience with distributed storage is um, actually nothing to do with cryptocurrency, um, uh, more uh, kind of on the academic side um, cool. through some of my uh, graduate research. So, Cool. Um, sounds very useful. Um, so for this particular position, so I, I just I want to open up this interview with a, a question that I think is really important to just clarify right off the bat. Um, most of my decentralized application development has involved, um, IPFS. And I think it's important to differentiate what you're doing versus what IPFS does, because it is, it is drastically different, but kind of in the same category of, you know, uh, needs, if that makes sense. So could you please, uh, just do that? Sure. So I think, you know. Well, uh, there's there's a lot of um, people in the space of who have played around with IPFS, um, and you know, trying to highlight the differences between them. Um, you know, they both allow you to store data, but it, from my understanding, with IPFS, 
there's no guarantee that that data will be around uh, once you store it uh, versus uh, that's very different on storage. You know, you can store the data and, and have guarantees that that data is going to be there and available for you. Um, so that's probably kind of the largest difference. Um, I think of IPFS as more kind of a uh, decentralized way to kind of find and address files, but there's still kind of a missing piece underneath, which is, you know, keeping the data around uh, over time, which is, you know, what we provide. So uh, maybe right. JP, JT can expand on that, but I think that's probably one of the largest difference uh, differences between the two. I do, I do think it's a good point that um, IPFS and uh, storage are, um, you know, okay, decentralized storage, but pretty different. Um, yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, I think um, ultimately my position, um, you know, just, just off the bat is I'm really hopeful and interested in IPFS's success, Filecoin uh, even, made safe. I think um, certainly with this space, um, kind of a rising tide raises all boats. <clears throat> And you know, sort of the more the more uh, mainstream decentralized storage is, uh, the more uptake and adoption it's going to take. You know, in 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 more um, uh, professional settings. <clears throat> so I'm really excited about uh, just sort of the whole space and and you know doing what we can to help. Um, but I do think that storage is targeting kind of a different market segment uh, than IPFS and uh, you know the, the Filecoin IPFS IPFS extensions are. Um, mainly, storage's primary objective is to take the existing centralized customers of cloud storage and help move the needle a little bit more towards decentralized storage. So our primary focus right now is an S3 compatible um, cloud storage platform. Um, and S3 compatibility actually imposes a lot of restrictions um, and a lot and makes a lot of design decisions for us. Um, and so, you know, IPFS, while IPFS, you know, of course, if you've used IPFS, you're familiar with kind of the immutable hashes that files are stored with. Um, uh, it's something where you can pin files on certain computers to help contribute those files to the network. Um, it's, it's a little more um, of a community, I think, in some sense. And for us, what we're trying to do is um, people pay us um, to store their data. And so we need to turn around and make sure that that data is reliable. There's no pinning. There's no um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, like... Uh, mechanism to allow people to choose which files get more redundancy. Um, it's just a matter of we want to store the data with S3 level durability, S3 level performance, um, S3 level compatibility, um, and um, do it in a way where there isn't actually a data center involved. Um, and so, um, yeah, we've, we've made a, a lot of different design decisions, right? Like at, at a core, files are mutable. You, it's a, it's a path-based system where you can change things. We don't have hashes that identify uh, files that you can address. Um, and it's, it's uh, something where, you know, obviously one of the, uh, one of the big issues right now with IPFS is if you go look at the IPFS hashes subreddit, um, you know, about half of them don't work. And I think part of that is, is, um, you know, just based on it's, it's kind of a volunteer platform, right? People are contributing on IPFS, their space and their uptime uh, to volunteer. And, um, you know, not, not every IPFS node is getting paid, right? And so Filecoin hopefully will help address some of that, but that's just sort of like off the bat get go for us is storage node operators get paid. Um, they get paid for good uptime, they get paid for reliability, they get paid for storing and returning data. Um, and, um, and that's what we need to do. We need to incentivize people uh, to do the right thing so that we can provide this S3 uh, level type storage. So yeah, kind of, kind of a different um, uh, market segment Ultimately, I think that if and when Filecoin launches uh, or MadeSafe gets their storage platform uh, to, a, uh, to a farther level, um, uh, I think ultimately um, that's going to be um, kind of a different storage product, right? Like, so there's differences already with cloud storage. There's S3, there's Glacier, there's, um, you know, uh, Google has their near line, cold line, Google storage, um, there's Wasabi, Backblaze, right? All of these have slightly different trade-offs. Um, and ultimately, I think that, you know, kind of some of the other players in the decentralized storage market are ultimately going to be um, the, the, the forefront of kind of a new, uh, uh, a new type of storage um, that I'm really excited about. And it's just kind of not what storage is focusing on right now. Storage is focusing on um, helping bring decentralization to the existing, you know, exabytes and yottabytes of data that are 
uh, ultimately going to be um, stored in cloud data centers unless someone does something. Okay. So hold well, on before okay, go before we go deeper because we can easily and quickly go deeper into what you just said. I would like to maybe back up just a little bit and 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 maybe provide some context as to why there's a need for decentralization in storage, um, where the problem exists currently and how things are stored in, in data centers and how decentralization helps mitigate those problems uh, and what the trade-offs are associated with the two. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of, com you know, ways you can attack that. Um, you know, one way that people kind of attack that is in terms of, you know, ideology, right? Um, you have these large companies, Amazon, you know, Microsoft, Google, that store majority of the world's data. And, you know, we as users want a lot more, you know, privacy and security and control over their, uh, our data. Um, but that, that's an interesting case for, for people and users, but it doesn't really uh, move the larger needle. Um, at the end of the day, uh, companies uh, and people are spending roughly $100 billion uh, on cloud storage every year, and that keeps on going up uh, everywhere, uh, every year. No one's saying, I need less cloud storage, please. And you know, there's a lot of problems associated with traditional problems, right? So you, you obviously want you know, faster speeds uh, to transfer that data. You want to uh, you know, spend you know, as, as less as possible. Um, you know, again, you, you want you know, security and privacy with that, you assume that. Uh, but the problem is if you're building out these you know, $600 million data centers, um, you know, that, that's a lot of capital that you have to invest into to building those out. And the way that we, we access and use the data is, is not in a centralized manner, right? Everyone's not in rural Nevada um, where that data center might be. Um, you know, the internet is a distributed uh, and decentralized network. And so we really kind of started from that segment to say, hey, if we store this data on uh, a distributed and decentralized internet, um, the architecture just looks more like how people use and access the data. And then as if by magic, you just start solving some of the problems, right? So if you want to bring costs down, well, you don't have to, you know, buy that fire suppression system and that expensive heating and cooling and the parking lot of the data center, like all those costs go away. Um, and when you're renting out, you know, people's just excess hard drive space. Um, but, you know, those costs exist in the data center. Um, you want it to be more performant. Uh, well, you know, if you're storing the data and it happens to be three blocks down rather than three states away, you know, then you can get a lot better latency and performance out of that. Uh, and then taking it, you know, from a position of privacy and security, since we're storing these on many untrusted devices all over the world, um, you know, the, we have to encrypt the data before it even, you know, touches the network. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's just taking a very fundamental different approach to the problem. And what you find is, again, that since the way we access and use the internet is in a decentralized and distributed way, you end up solving a lot of these traditional, um, you know, uh, uh, problems that people will have. And so we've really focused on you know, using, utilizing that, that really extreme advantages and boiling it down into a simple package um, and a simple service that people can use. Um, and so we can start kind of attacking that, you know, large hundred billion dollar market and is saying, Hey, you're using, you know, most likely Amazon S3 and you're paying this much. Um, uh, but if you maybe take five minutes to replace a couple lines of config, you know, we can save you, uh, you know, half as amount of money with better performance. You know, that's, that's a no brainer. Um, and so that's where we're really focusing on is, is using the advantages of technology in a simple enough package uh, to make a, a big impact on kind of the traditional cloud market. So the, you, you mentioned S3 early on um, as kind of part of your solution. Um, you're not dependent on S3 or what, where can people store these files um, other than just like S3? Like, are you competing with S3? Like what's going on there? Can you clarify that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll make a, a comment on that, and then JT can probably follow up with some some additional useful information there. Um, it really started with um, kind of a V2 of the network. So, 
Um, we've been around for a while. We've launched, you know, many uh, iterations of the network. Um, uh, version two over uh, the network that we launched um, last year um, in early 2017 um, scaled up to about 150 petabytes of data. Uh, one petabyte is 1,000 terabytes, and we had about 150,000 uh, people. Um, uh, renting out their, their hard drive space in over 180 countries. So huge network, we learned a lot from it. But one of the things that we realized and learned from actually having this you know, live network in production um, is that you know, we, we had libraries that people could use to, to integrate with. Um, and there are kind of storage specialized uh, libraries. So it might take someone you know, hours uh, or, or, or days to, to figure out how to integrate. Um, but if you look at the traditional market, most uh, applications are using, you know, something like Amazon S3 to store its data. It's, it's kind of the standard that everyone uses um, for good or for bad, right? It's this the standard that people use. Um, and so we, you know, looking towards the V3 network and what we really wanted to change and make things better we thought, hey, you know, let's make this Amazon S3 compatible, not dependent, right? It's this, it's compatible with those those APIs. So people who, you know, are are are, are building applications, like, can literally spend a couple of minutes uh, to get something working. Um, and so, you know, we made that change, and it's it's really paid off so far as we've had you know partners. Uh, and, and customers uh, play around with our early version of, of, of the V3 of the storage network. And they're just like, yeah, it took me minutes um, to integrate. And that's, that's what's really important because if you look at the you know, decentralized and distributed landscape, there's a lot of people um, and a lot of technology that's really impactful, um, but you know, it's, it's hard to use, right? Um, you know, try to set up a, you know, get someone to set up a Bitcoin wallet or some of these things, it's certainly come a long way um, from from the early days, but it's still you know very difficult and hard. And so, what we really wanted to do is say, hey, we want to impact the traditional market, um, and we want to have a big impact. And the easiest way to do that is not making it hard for people to switch. Uh, taking them minutes uh, is important. So uh, that's that's one design decision that we made. That's very very different from many of the other uh, players in the space. Yeah, yeah so that's... so to answer answer your question directly, we do compete with S3. We mimic the S3 API. We don't use S3. Um, we um, are a drop-in replacement for S3. And what that is is a really good way to lower the barrier of entry for people who are already dependent upon that standard, which you talked about, like using things like S3. So they can that's switch right. an entire portion of their back end by changing just a few lines in the actual code. Yeah, maybe even just configuration information only and no code. That's 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 yeah. that's a really good, um, in my opinion, uh, way to get people to use your network versus others and allow like uh, people to into it what's actually going on, or not, maybe not even need to into it what's actually going on, but want uh, potential performance benefits or cost benefits of using your network versus S three. I'm curious. So, like you, before, you said um, a lot of that. You said that, like, say, for instance, I'm going to use IPFS as the example here because everyone's familiar with it. Uh, the hash that you receive is based on the content you put forward. And so you know that if the hash changes, the content changes, and you have some guarantees around the data that you're actually uh, getting. How do you do, and since you said the files are mutable within your system, how do you give uh, guarantees like that if you can? Yeah, so this is this is actually going into kind of a, a much wider discussion about our overall architecture and kind of some of the decisions we've made. Um, ultimately, some of the decisions that we've made are potentially a little surprising. Um, since uh, the only thing we use um, a blockchain for is for background settlement and payments. Um, and so in terms of, you know, a lot of a lot of these cloud storage products, these decentralized cloud storage products, um, spend a lot of time um, talking about their consensus protocol. Um, or they do things like these, you know, they have like a, a Merkle tree uh, to construct the file system. They do content addressable storage, like they hash the data uh, to make sure that you um, know what data you're getting. Um, because honestly, you know, these, these platforms are built in ways where you can't trust anybody, right? You just can't trust any computer that you're storing any of the data on. 
And so we've made we've made a slightly different um, incremental decision. Um, again, our our roadmap and our plan and our goal is to kind of be a little uh, more Promethean and take the fire down from uh, you know uh, Olympia down to the masses of de of decentralization. Um, and so we want to bring people steps closer instead of making it a huge leap. Um, and so the reason why I say it like that is because um, one of the things we've done is we've said, you know, we can probably get a significant improvement in performance and um, a significant uh, uh, reduction in complexity um, by uh, making some trade-offs. One of them is, okay, there there are computers that um, we want people to choose to trust within the system. And so by that, what I mean is there's three different actors in our system. There's storage nodes, there's satellites, and there's uplinks. And so we talk about this a lot in our recently released 90 page white paper. Um, <laughs> um, that took way too- Light many, reading. Yeah, just way too many months of time on that one. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so the 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 storage nodes are untrusted. Those are the those are the nodes that are the vast majority <clears throat> of actors in our system. Storage node operators uh, provide their hard drive space and provide um, storage data. Um, and then there's satellites, and satellites are run potentially by you. You can run your own satellite as a customer of storage, or you can use a satellite that someone you trust has set up. And so this is the trade-off that we made is we said, all right, we believe that it's possible for people to still get most of the benefit of decentralized storage um, uh, and um, are comfortable having an account on some specific server somewhere or specific set of servers, right? It doesn't have to be a satellite isn't necessarily a single server for uptime. It could be a small cluster of servers, but the question is a trust boundary. And so a satellite is a small trust boundary that you are comfortable giving some metadata to. And so that's how we actually we actually avoid uh, the white paper talks uh, quite a bit about um, uh, uh, one of the one of the ways that we get a significant increase in performance um, is um, avoiding coordination where possible. There's a, a growing body of um, uh, distributed uh, systems research, academic distributed systems research, um, that talks about how coordination um, is one of the easiest things. Avoiding coordination is one of the easiest things to do to get your 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 system to be able to scale and continue to perform. Right. And so, what I mean by coordination is, um, if you have, um, uh, for instance. Bitcoin is a great example of coordination. Everything is coordinating. And so um, uh, adding, because everything has to agree on this single global ledger, adding more computers doesn't get you more throughput. You know, the amount of miners in, in Bitcoin has increased significantly, but the amount of transactions Bitcoin can process hasn't increased. On the alternate, on the on the flip side, um, S3, the way that Amazon has designed S3 is, um, uh, very coordination avoidant in the sense that it scales horizontally uh, significantly. Uh, other things that scale horizontally are Cassandra or um, CockroachDB or Spanner, Google's Spanner database, um, scales horizontally. And, and horizontal scaling requires that you are able to, um, it, by adding more computers, you get more throughput. Um, and the way that you do that is you 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 can't have every operation go through a single global ledger. Um, and so um, by having everyone choose their own satellite to store metadata on is kind of a way that we've partitioned the network into these little trust zones that allow us to avoid coordination. Um, uh, and so we talk about that a lot in the white paper. Um, and then and then, of course, one of the main things that we want to do is allow people to be able to use storage, access it directly from very lightweight clients like their mobile phones, like uh, their you know web browser, their desktops. And so an uplink is the third actor in our system. And an uplink coordinates directly with storage nodes and with satellites with, for the metadata that you have. Um, and so um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a surprising design. It's not maybe what you'd expect if you read about IPFS or, or Filecoin, but it actually ends up being almost exactly the overall uh, design that um, a lot of other distributed storage systems that aren't decentralized use. Like um, I, I don't know, I think I think people have different definitions of distributed and decentralized. So I probably should use different words. But um, Luster, 
is a w very well known uh, used in the academic uh, yeah, uh, super absolutely industry, right uh, luster it runs like 50 of the top 100 fastest computers in the world um it's a it's a storage platform that's distributed and um uh, uh the, the the overall architecture of of luster is there's three components there's clients there's metadata servers and there's storage nodes and so um the design of storage uh, storj um is a very much inspired by systems like luster that makes a lot of sense yeah and and to just you know put it into more you know concrete um examples you know jt comes with a lot of experience um you know both in the literature and you know hands-on experience with these these many distributed uh and and just in general uh storage systems uh and we've come in you know launching our v2 network um which you know outclasses pretty much all the other decentralized uh storage networks and binds in terms of scale and magnitude and, and we learned a lot from that um, but it's, it's all about choosing, you know, a proper design, uh, that, that works in scales. Um, I, I won't name any names, but, um, there is, you know, particular storage, uh, uh distributed storage platform that, uh, relies, uh, on, on consensus and, you know, users have experienced issues as, you know, they're uploading, you know, a cat picture size file, uh, a couple of megs and um you know they're getting like, like six hours of upload time right that's you know you might have you know the nice ideological components in there but <laughs> if it takes six hours to upload a cat picture you know that's that's not great um and so we really wanted to come uh with something that you know works and scales off the bat um allows you to get you know performance uh, that of what you 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 expect were better uh, and then over time, you know, we can make improvements, incremental improvements uh, on that design uh, to make it more uh, trustless and more robust. Um, so, for example, if you, if you really, if immutability was really important to you, you could, uh, you know, write a wrapper uh, of RPFS in storage <laughs> and you would have, you know, your cake and eat it too. And so we really want to make sure there's a solid base layer um to to build upon that that works well um and so it sounds like you're that. you're focusing a lot on the user experience so maybe you could step us through the the user experience of getting storage on the system in the three peer classes that you've kind of outlined in your white paper so you know if i wanted to be an uplink node i guess node might be the appropriate term i'm not certain um then what would be my path to that? If I wanted to be a satellite, what would be my path to that? If I just want to be a storage client, what would be my path to that? And what is the ascent of models around each one of those peer classes? That's a good question. Um, I, for for an uplink, an, an uplink actually is a peer class that we're really uh, describing to, to match almost any application that uses storage. So um, we're, we're um, ultimately, we have an uplink uh, uh, service uh, in our storage repo right now, but we're working on releasing lib uplink, which is just a library that processes can, they can link against and use. Um, and so lib uplink, we're going to uh, re-release uh, our v2 lib storage backed by lib uplink. And so um, all of our language bindings will be just lib uplink. And so anything that uses that library, we're, for the purposes of the white paper, calling it an uplink. Um, so there's actually nothing to do to become an uplink node um, or an uplink peer. Um, it's just something that naturally happens if you're using storage. Um, we do have an S3 gateway that um, allows an, uh, uh, a computer to pretend to be the S3 um, API. Um, it serves the S3 compatible endpoints. Um, and so you can run an, an uplink gateway that way. Um, but that's that's kind of the end of you know there's not really anything that anyone would expect that you do uh, to be an uplink node you wouldn't be an uplink node for someone else if that makes sense it's only if you're using the network um to be a storage node um that's actually our next release that's coming up uh, a, a little bit later this year um uh, or sorry at, at the beginning of next year i, I should say um uh, uh our storage node release is our next big release where people will be able to um Currently, we have a waitlist, um, and all the waitlist is is we are 
currently using the certificate authority to sign certificates to join the network. Uh, we will strip that out uh, eventually, um, but for now, uh, we want to make sure that we grow the network at a kind of like a uh, not a bursty rate. So we want to meter uh, how quickly the network grows. Um, but our next release is a storage node release. You'll um, join the network. You'll you'll create an identity. It's a long lived identity that um, identifies you across you know multiple upgrades and reboots. Um, and then you will just um, uh, configure it with, um, you know, kind of where you want to get paid. And that storage node will just start running and start advertising itself to the network as a recipient of storage. You'll be able to configure how much bandwidth, how much disk space you want it to uh, use, uh, and it'll kind of just do its thing. It's sort of set it and forget it. I mean, it is really important that storage node uh, operators choose um, computers uh, or servers that uh, will have good uptime. Um, if a node doesn't have um, high quality uptime or high quality availability, um, it will ultimately no longer get chosen for new data and um, will stop getting income. Um, running a satellite is probably the most intensive process because the satellite does have um, a number of uh, responsibilities, um, but running a satellite hopefully at some point will be as simple as um, uh, you know, installing our binary. Uh, we use Go for all of our programming uh, programs, so this is all statically linked binaries that are easy to install. But you know, if, if a Docker container is is your jam, we'll have a Docker container that'll make it easy too. Um, you pointed at a, a, a just a little bit of. Uh, uh, configuration and a database, and you let that run, um, that will have a, an admin, a web admin console uh, interface that you can point around and, and see how things are going. Um, and so running that will probably be um, a bit more like running, um, you know, some sort of service. Uh, you'll want it to be, um, you'll want it to have like a, a domain name that people can access it over and a few other things. But otherwise, um, it should be as simple as DNS entry, running a service, pointing at a database, that's it. So that's kind of like how you would be a satellite operator, how you would be a storage node operator. But why would you be a satellite operator? What is what is your incentive around that? Every uh, operator gets paid. Um, a uh, storage node operator gets paid for the storage, um, but storage isn't the only thing that needs to happen in the network. So the white paper talks a lot about repair and auditing. Um, and so one of the things that we do, and, and, and I know you mentioned you'd like to talk more about erasure codes. Um, there's actually a lot to talk about with erasure codes. Um, we've chosen erasure codes instead of replication. And there's actually um, a really deep uh, argument about why that's um, actually critical and vital. Uh, Real quick. To, Real quick, can you please define erasure codes for those in our audience that don't understand it? That's a great point. An erasure code, so so yeah, just briefly, um, when you store data, um, the question is, how do you deal with nodes disappearing? So at, let's say I store data on the storage network, and some storage nodes um, lose power, or an asteroid hits them, or the storage node operator decides he hates us and leaves, or uh, you know, uh, there's a bunch of different uh, potential outcomes where um, you know, a storage node operator might just decide she's had it with the software and just wants to install and leave. So um, at any point, we might lose data. And so the question is, what do we do to make sure that all of the data that people have given us, we can still return when they want it? Um, replication is a common choice. You just make more copies. It's kind of like the most obvious thing to do. Um, you just, any, any incoming data, um, you make, you know, three copies, five copies, 10 copies. Um, the V2 network, uh, we, which, um, you know, as Sean pointed out, we learned a lot from. This V2 network used a mixture. Um, it used uh, replication and erasure codes, but other systems use only replication, and, and our V3 system only uses erasure codes. And what an erasure code is, is instead of storing data as copies, we actually use a pretty interesting math trick, which um, uh, I can explain in a second, um, to break the file up into multiple pieces where let's say a file comes in, we break it into 40 pieces. We only need any 20 of those pieces to recover the file, any 20. So it could be the last 20, the first 20, every even piece, every odd piece. It doesn't matter. Any 20 of those 40 pieces will be able to recover the original file. And so that's an erasure code. Um, and there's a number of different erasure code algorithms, but the most common one that's used in um, you know, making it so you can scratch your CD and it still plays music, um, satellite communication, bunch of stuff is an algorithm called Reed Solomon. And so Reed Solomon um, 
kind of the way it works, just sort of like at a high level is, you know, if you remember from math class in high school or early college, if you, if you do, um, you know, any two points will uh, identify a line, right? And so if you put more points on that line, it's still the same line. So any two points will uniquely determine a line, regardless of what points, where those points are on that line. Um, and then in the same way, in a, a quadratic equation, any three points will uniquely determine a quadratic equation. Any four points will uniquely determine a cubic equation. And so uh, um, in the same way, any 20 points will uniquely determine a degree 19 polynomial. And so if we break, take the file, break it into 20 points, 20 math points, like where we just treat them as numbers because it's just ones and zeros after all. Um, we take the file, we break it into 20 pieces. We treat those pieces as points on a degree 19 polynomial. And then we oversample the polynomial. We generate another 20 points on that polynomial. Now, any 20 of those 40 points will allow us to regenerate the original file. And so um, what we do is we actually do this on a kilobyte by kilobyte level so we can stream data through the network. Um, and so this is how we do video streaming and, and streaming storage of log files um, while we still get this property. So um, we choose some nodes, to, storage nodes to upload to. We take the file, we break it up into um, all these pieces using Reed Solomon, and then we store it on those uh, nodes um, uh, in a way that now we can lose any 20 of those nodes and still recover it. We don't actually use 2040 um, currently. Um, the numbers are actually something that is, uh, uh, you know, we determine based on the durability and the current characteristics of the network, but that's kind of the idea behind um, erasure codes. Um, and I guess the most important thing about erasure codes, I guess, to point out is the durability of the data is much higher using erasure codes. Um, and the reason for that is because when we talk about replication, if you just make copies, let's say we have, you know, you, you take the data and you store it on a bunch of nodes. Um, and um, if you are only doing copies and you want to be able to survive, you know, like four no node failures, um, you have to have five copies. Right. And so now what that means is there's five times as much hard drive space being used as the file that you care about um, because there's five copies. With Reed Solomon, with this 2040 scheme, um, each piece is 1 20th of the file. So that actually means since there's 40 20ths, it's only two times the disk space. So that's called the expansion factor. And the expansion factor is significantly less with erasure codes. So um, what that means is it uses way less bandwidth. It uses way less disk space. It dilutes. Um, it, it makes it so that we can afford to pay more to storage node operators per byte. Um, and it actually makes much higher durability than replication would. In short, um, it basically makes, it, it gives the same guarantees, but more efficiently. Yes, that's exactly it. Yeah. Uh, so and it's cheaper for the customer. Yeah. On, the, on that side, um, read solving codes are old as, as hell. Yes, um, they're from 1960s, and there's been a right. lot, a lot of new uh, error erasure code uh, systems out there. One of the more interesting ones that just came out of patent is the tornado code. And one of the downsides to read Solomon, I think, is I that think February, right? Or I, think, I think the original fountain codes come out of patent in February. And I'm not sure tornado co codes. Tornado are. codes should be out of patent, if I recall from my research from last okay, year. Okay. Um, yeah, I should look into that again. Yeah, because like Reed Solomon, its encoding time is tremendously, it, it's like, I think it's O N squared in order to do uh, encoding or no, it's N log N encoding and to decode it's O N squared, whereas tornado codes are pretty much just N log, natural log N. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty quick. So like what would take like a 16 megabyte file would probably take, I don't know, 30,000 seconds to um to encode and maybe like 13,000 to decode and read solomon it's 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 like four seconds to to one second in in tornado and so like uh the the trade-off there is of course the the length of the uh erasure code is higher in tornado but like you said it's still way less than replication and way less than doubling the size of the file so I'm kind of interested in what made you go with the Reed Solomon route rather than some of the more modern uh, erasure codes that are out there. So I think um, that's a great question. Um, 
for the most part, I've kind of just avoided fountain codes just due to patent encumberment. And kind of my personal philosophy is to not go read patents because I don't want, I want, would rather preserve plausible deniability. Um, but in terms of Reed Solomon, it is old. Um, uh, it could be faster, but it's not like it's slow. Um, Reed Solomon, a good enco a good decoder can decode at 300 megabits a second or megabytes a second, um, which is usually faster than the links that you're talking on. So, um, you know, we we think that overall the, the major the major performance uh, uh, requirements for us are actually in terms of bandwidth um, and um, uh, throughput and latency. And so the Reed Solomon thing just isn't the lowest hanging fruit. Like, you know, uh, replacing it with a better uh, erasure code set scheme. Um, this one works. Um, it's we're, we're conveniently configured in such a way that it's easy to replace Reed Solomon with something better as soon as it becomes our main bottleneck. Um, but for now, I mean, it, yeah, like I said, 300 megabytes a second is certainly not as fast as it could be, but it's not the main bottleneck for competing with S3. I hear that. Okay, so what? Um, just so the audience is clear, what is the um, maximal loss that you can suffer on a file and be able to recover it using erasure codes? It depends on your configuration with your erasure code. Right now, I think our code base defaults to um, 2985 or maybe 2990 or something like that. It's not quite the same thing as a 2x uh, expansion vector. It's a little more than 2x, obviously. But um, what that means is if you have 85 pieces, you only need 29 of them. So. So what's that? Eighty-five minus twenty-nine is and the full and the full erasure code, hmm? and the full erasure code. So you can't just so even though you need twenty-nine pieces, you also need the full erasure code in order to recover those twenty-nine pieces. Correct. What do you mean by full erasure code? In other words, when you have the file itself and the erasure code is basically tagged onto the end of the file, let's just consider it. No, like no, no. no, the erasure coded pieces are actually all you need. So when I talk about these pieces, you only need 29 of the 85 pieces. Those 29 pieces are the output of the erasure code function. So that is all you need. You only need those 29 pieces to recover the original file. Is um, is this configurable for the end user based on like their, their preferences on how much they need their data available? Yeah, so our intention is to make it so that people can choose their durability and then we'll have an estimator for given durability what the best read Solomon choices are. Now the trade-off for that is going to be price um, because the more storage nodes spread your data across, it's going to cost more. But yeah, we do want to have a sliding scale where you can say, look, you know, I don't really care about durability so much. This is something that I'm only storing for 10 days, um, so I don't want to pay a bunch for durability. Or you can say, I'm planning on saving this for, you know, you know, the next 50 years, and it's, you know, my kids' baby photos. So I want really high durability. Um, so yeah, so there's a number of different choices you can make on that spectrum. Cool. So let's talk about privacy then. Um, uh, so, you know, basically, you, you, pitch that privacy is one of the key things. You're using a certificate authority to get people online. Uh, how are you handling encryption and who handles that? I think it's uh, the, up, is it the uplink load that's yes. doing all the encrypting? That's and right. yes. and how, how do you, uh, what, what is your scheme for handling and delegating the access to a file? Sure, great. So, um, so right, so the uplink is what does all of the encryption, and we have a, a really stringent uh, uh, policy, which is that um, none of the other systems have any access to any unencrypted data. So the the, the satellite doesn't have access to an, uh, unencrypted data. The satellite only stores encrypted metadata, and it doesn't have the keys. Um, if you lose your keys with storage, you lose your data. Um, and so that's kind of a weird user experience trade-off for people who are used to password recovery screens. But um, we think on balance, it's probably um, the better choice um, from a privacy perspective. Um, the encryption scheme that we use um, is configurable. Um, we default to AES GCM, which is one of the um, one of the new authenticated encryption schemes. Uh, 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 I guess it's not terribly new, but um, uh, but um, honestly, my preference is actually one of the uh, uh, Daniel J. Bernstein uh, uh, encryption methods, which is the secret box encryption method, which is um, uh, Poly 1305 and Cha Cha. Um, 
encryption. Um, and um, anyway, uh, what you can do is you can choose your encryption key. You configure your uplink with your encryption settings, and then it encrypts all of the data before it ever gets read Solomon encoded, before it ever gets sent anywhere. And so the only way you can retrieve the data is if you have that key um, with the uplink that's doing the retrieval. Um, because this is important, you know, we want to be able to support a lot of the functionality that S3 does, which is like, you know, being able to share a file with someone. You, know, you might want to be able to share, you know, uh, certain different delegated access patterns, right? Um, and S3 has a bunch of rich um, uh, permissions. Um, so um, the, uh, uh, the goal for us is to actually make it that we have um, encryption that's um, hierarchical encryption. So our encryption system is based on uh, I think BIP39 hierarchical encryption. I mean, Bitcoin did, uh, you know, hierarchically encrypted wallets so that you can have a sub wallet that you share with someone, but you only have a master key. Um, we're doing the same kind of thing, but based on encrypted path names. So every um, path element, so like by a path element, I mean, if you have like, you know, music slash, um, you know, Ariana Grande slash thank you next.mp3, right? Um, uh, the path elements are music and then Ariana Grande, and then thank you next.mp3. Those are all separate path elements and they're separated by slashes. And so the goal is maybe I wanna share with you just my music folder, but I don't wanna share with you the full bucket. So the, the encrypted path for the music folder, um, I would give you that prefix and I would give you an encryption key that allows you to access um, um, a hierarchically encrypted uh, in, a key derivation scheme for just everything under that music folder. So there's a there's an issue with BIP39 in terms of uh, how you can you can use a specific subset of of uh, like sub paths to then regenerate parent paths. Is that an issue that can come with like maybe potentially exposing uh, access to files you don't want people to have? Well, so I mean, I guess I guess what I'd say with that is um, we're not actually using BIP. Oh, you just want to give like an analogy of how things work. That's we're we're our scheme is inspired by BIP39. Okay. There had to be some differences. Um, and so ultimately in terms of like, okay, just in general security vulnerabilities and stuff like that, we think that we've kind of got it covered, but that's really hard to say for certain. Yeah, Where you, is, need, you need a lot of, different? like you need, you need a, the wild exposure and people trying to break things before you have stronger guarantees around the security model of how you do things. We need a lot of eyeballs and we're also um, uh, getting a security audit. So um, we're getting leased authority who, you know, that's Zuko's uh, company prior to Zcash um, uh, to do uh, a security audit for us um, uh, after we're a little bit farther along. Speaking of audits, uh, your system does audit files, correct? Uh, so it makes yeah. sure that you have some sort of uptime guarantee and it has some uh, ability to guarantee that the file being served is actually the file that's, that's, that's supposed to be served. Is that correct? Yes. That's okay, right. so how do, how do you do that? What do you what is what is your schema for verifying that a file is the right files? Um, if you're not hash addressing it, although you might be, I just don't I know the details on that yet. Um, and how do you how do you know that uh, the files are actually being served to anybody who requests it, and not just the person who's doing the validating? That's a great question. Um, I think I think some of the answers there are. Well, so let me let me just start from the beginning. So uh, that hierarchical encryption scheme um, does we're, we are using authenticated encryption, which does both encryption and and signing, right? So you know if um, uh, you can't you can't um, the the data is is uh, uh, written in such a way that um, even though it's not a hash of the contents, um, the file isn't named after a hash of the contents. We have a hash of the contents. So we know that the data is correct because the hashes are all the way included through the encryption scheme. So um, that's how you know that the data that you're getting is right. Um, in terms of um, uh, you know auditing and repair, our auditing and repair system is um, uh, uh, we, we've made a number of different trade-offs both on those fronts. Um, Auditing is is written in such a way where our goal for auditing this is this is actually um, I thought kind of um, an interesting uh, sort of trade off that we made. Um, most of the auditing systems that are written about for decentralized storage, and I remember uh, Vitalik uh, wrote um, a blog post about you know kind of uh, uh, proof of uh, 
proof of retrieval, I think, where basically um, you store a Merkle tree of, of pre-generated challenges. Um, and there's actually uh, there's actually a number of different um, uh, papers uh, about um, proof of retrievability um, that include um, ways of generating um, uh, uh, challenges uh, ahead of time, and then you have a finite number of challenges. There's also some homomorphic techniques that allow you to have an, an unlimited amount of challenges. Um, and what we're doing actually is, you know, this we decided that our auditing system, its primary goal is, is actually like, this is kind of a big shortcut um, for performance reasons. We're actually um, not using our auditing system to find if files are bad. Um, and so that's actually a really interesting difference. Most of these proof of retrievability schemes are trying to figure out if the file is retrievable and it does it by random sampling. So it's assuming that you're not gonna audit the entire file every time. What you're going to do is you're going to audit little small ranges of the file. And probabilistically, you can be pretty confident that the file is there completely intact because the store can't predict what your audit would have been until the store gets it. And so this sort of sampling kind of incentivizes the store to keep the entire file because it can't predict what the audit's going to be about. And so it's the sampling process that ends up allowing us to be pretty confident in a general proof of replication scheme that the file is there without doing a lot of work. Um, and so we're actually going one step further and we're saying the question is, is the storage node good? Is the storage node playing by the rules? And so we have a list of all of the files that we believe a storage node has uh, on the satellite. The satellite knows what files a storage node should have based on the satellite's metadata. And so the satellite is going to consider all those files and then consider all the ranges within those files and then do random sample audits on randomly selected files. And so the goal of auditing is not to determine if files are bad. The goal of auditing is to determine if a node is bad. And if the node is no longer playing by the rules and keeping the data it's supposed to, then the node is, is penalized and ultimately ejected. Um, so auditing actually doesn't care so much about the data correctness. The thing that auditing cares about is catching nodes with uh, uh, basically um, uh, uh, just sampling, um, uh, spot checking. The auditing system is just spot checking nodes to make sure that it's good. The thing that actually checks to make sure that the data is correct is our repair system. So our repair system, if it determines that a node is bad or a node has been offline too much, which is an interesting separation, um, we think that most of the data loss that's going to happen in our system is going to be due to nodes going offline and not due, not due to nodes being um, uh, corrupted or mutating data. Yeah, I'd imagine yeah. churn is much more of a problem than like churn, standard churn, data corrupt, corruption. Exactly right. Churn is going to be our biggest problem by far. And so we have a very um, uh, uh, high incentive, a very strong motivation to care a lot about churn more than anything else. And so our auditing and repair system is kind of all predicated around we need to be able to quickly determine which nodes are online and how long they've been online and if they're likely to come back. And if what happens is if it turns out that, you know, 10 of the 40 nodes that store a specific file are offline and uh, or or have been marked bad by the spot check auditing system, then we need to repair that file. And repairing the file is going to involve actually a Merkle tree of hashes. And so that's where we're actually able to confirm the file is correct. Um, we have the pieces that we need. Uh, we can do the read Solomon without doing any decryption um, and um, uh, recover the original pieces and replace the missing pieces onto new storage nodes. So that's something that the satellite does to make sure the data is good. And the last question you asked was, how do we confirm the storage node is um, uh, playing by the rules for uplinks as well as satellites? And I think um, that's that's an area where we still have a little bit more research and a little bit more to explore. Um, but the plan so far, if that becomes a problem, is to just consider statistically reports from uplinks about storage nodes not playing by the rules. The goal is if you only need 29 out of 85 pieces, most of the nodes are going to be um, it's going to be very easy to recover your file. And so the number of nodes that are going to be um, you know, uh, malicious uh, will be quickly detected by a bunch of uplinks complaining. Um, I think what's interesting about the way that we've, uh, you know, done this Reed Solomon thing is it turns out we don't actually depend on any specific piece. And so what that means is that our, our, our speed 
um, now only depends on the fastest responders of any request. So we actually, when we do a download, we over request pieces more than we need. And then we're able to return the data to the, the user as soon as the fastest responses have come back. And so even though our storage nodes have highly variable performance, um, we actually get the best of the storage nodes. So our high variability, we're able to turn into a big strength uh, based on that architecture decision. So what's, uh, let's talk about some of the common attack vectors on kind of decentralized systems here. Um, like what, what, what about like, um, what if somebody throws up a ton of nodes and gets good reputation on them and then starts manipulating the network? Like how, how do you mitigate some of these like, or, or Sybil attacks or something or Eclipse? Like these are all common things. What kind of threat models are you considering and what, what, uh, what ones are still kind of in areas of research and what ones do you think are not an issue? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, we uh, off the bat um, decided that um, our nodes would actually do um, at very least proof of work uh, to join the network. It's kind of it's kind of sort of a dumb side thing that we're just making nodes do. Um, it 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 simply it, it removes a bunch of simple attacks, but it doesn't really do anything about a, a motivated attacker. So if someone if someone has a bunch of you know time, months worth of time, can generate these IDs for joining the network, they join the network. They just kind of hang out on the network for a long time, uh, and then start um, uh, and then start trying to manipulate the network. That for our original design, that was actually kind of a problem. Um, yeah, I mean, you're attacking I, Amazon's business model with S3 kind of a little right. bit here. So like they have the power, they have the ability, right. state actors do as well. If they don't like what you're doing for one reason or the other. That's right. You know? So so the question really is how do we make that? It's not really something that we can, I mean, again, this is the same thing with Bitcoin. Bitcoin has the 51% attack, which is you know just something that hopefully is, is too expensive for anyone to do. It's kind of the best solution that you can- yeah. And even then it's identifiable like the whole network because of its public consensus model um it, it, it you know they, there's been a 51 percent attack on bitcoin and it was successful and it lasted for a little while and um you know it didn't actually have any negative consequences nobody's able to capitalize on it but in this particular system it could actually attack your straight up business model here so yeah so so the goal i mean yeah the the question is how 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 much work would someone have to do to be able to attack our network and ultimately, a state actor is going to be able, if they are motivated, there, there are a lot of attacks that are going to be very difficult to deal with, right? Um, okay, if um, we're storing 85 pieces of anyone's file and, you know, we, looking at our statistics, storage nodes have a certain, you know, failure rate, there's a certain churn rate, but all of a sudden the entire internet is shut down, um, yeah, the data is not coming back until the, the network's back up, right? So there's a, a number of different things that uh, certainly motivated uh, powerful actors can do. But so the question is, in terms of our threat model, we want to make sure that we are uh, robust enough against the things that are that, that are within reach, I think, of, of most most attacks. And so um, one of the things is we were we were kind of vulnerable to this problem of, of someone spinning up a bunch of nodes. Um, in our early draft period of the white paper, we, we sent our white paper off to a bunch of reviewers. And, and one of our reviewers graciously was um, uh, uh, the actually the author of Kadimlia, um, uh, 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 Patar Maimon Cub. Um, and so he did a fantastic job uh, reviewing our uh, uh, white paper and came up with um, an improvement actually, which is um, part of uh, uh, our system with Kadimlia. The goal is to make it so that the storage nodes um, have to provide, I mean, it's, it's kind of easy to spin up some storage nodes that just sit on the network and then start mucking with things. It's kind of hard to provide petabytes of hard drive space and then start mucking with things, right? Like that's actually a really expensive thing to do. If you're that motivated to provide our network with petabytes of good hard drive space, then yeah, um, that's kind of really hard to defend against. Um, so that's just sort of a problem in general with this decentralized storage platforms. Um, and we believe that that's, as, that's unlikely enough of a problem to not worry about that too much. Someone being able to spend petabytes, you know, su supply petabytes of data to the network um, only to just mess around with people. Um, and so the goal is we actually uh, made a change in our architecture um, based on the feedback that we got, which was um, that um, Kademlia, there's actually two tiers with Kademlia. 
uh, the, the DHT, the distributed hash table we use. And you can't participate in Kademlia until you've passed enough audits, until you've proven that you have hard drive space on that node. Um, and so that's a way of making sure that these aren't, this isn't just a Sybil attack if that type of thing happens. We're immune to Sybil attacks. We're immune to these type, types of things because it's actually really expensive uh, to get a node uh, that has enough reputation in the network to be able to um, uh, 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 end up manipulating or denying service to someone with the data. And that's why it's also important to get, you know, to scale. Um, and get as large as possible because as the network grows larger, then it becomes uh, much more difficult to pull off these attacks. Definitely. And and so I guess the question then is there are certain major systems. So you, you, you say like um, we're replacing data centers, 600 computers, whatever, but like most of those systems that require that kind of storage space um, also require a certain amount of guarantee and a certain amount of security against uh, attacks like like we just said, to an extremely high five nine degree. Um, do you feel like storage will be a direct replacement for them, or is this more tuned towards a casual small business audience, small to mid? But I think I think that um, this is this is an this is an observation uh, just sort of from my experience at Mosey. Um, the hardest part at Mosey initially was um, when when we were doing, so Mosey was an online backup company. Um, and it was one of the first online backup companies that said, we're gonna store your, your most important data in the cloud. And so it was actually really challenging to convince companies that what they wanted to do was take their, you know, their most important data and store it off premise. Um, you know, this was, you know, back in the time when like, Iron Mountain and and some of these like huge uh, uh, backup companies, you know, would bring tapes and then they'd like truck your tapes off um, to, to make your backups just because people really cared about the backups and they weren't really sure if they should trust someone to just store their, you know, your backups in someone else's servers. Is that safe to do? Is that good? And, and kind of Mosey's whole premise was, yes, it's fine. Encryption is good. We can store the data. You got to trust somebody like you're trusting your tape provider. Um, and so um, ultimately it was kind of a fight um, and it's kind of laughable now thinking about how every business has moved to the cloud. Everything's run in Google Cloud Platform or Azure or AWS. It's been such a dramatic change in the last 10 years in terms of what people are willing to accept and willing to adopt. And so ultimately for storage, you know, this, this, this shift to decentralization um, off the bat, it's going to not be something that we'll be able to convince everyone is a good idea. Um, uh, we're definitely going to be uh, talking with early adopters at the beginning, but the goal is to make something that is high quality enough and um, performant enough and reliable enough and secure enough um, that people will, you know, it'll turn heads and people will will start to really open up to the idea of decentralized storage and not say things that, you know, the sorts of things that I say all that, you know, I, I hear all the time, like, oh, wait, so you're going to just store my data under uh, my neighbor's bed? Um, well, it's encrypted, right? And so it's it's the same kind of conversation uh, that, that, you know, Mosey had 10 years ago is this is a new paradigm. The paradigm has enough benefits that we should consider it. Um, and um, uh, it really just is going to take some people uh, jumping in. And again, it just goes right back to what Sean said, which is the larger the network, the better this is going to be. I'd be curious yeah. about, um, so the, the part of part of your early adoption is going to be, uh, as always, in a new, new brand new technology that distributes things, is going to be some type of illicit media. How do you... How you approach that subject? Are you it, everything's encrypted, of course, but are you breaking up the files of the array? Like, is it do you store all of the erasure codes in a single place? Are those distributed across people, so not a, a file isn't completely stored on a single node, so that people who are using your services, just like hosting yeah. storage is, uh, media, aren't don't they basically can't ever be complicit in any type of storage of uh, illicit media. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, yeah, we got this question all the time at Mosey, actually, about whether or not we were storing, you know, what we were storing. Uh, we got this question at Space Monkey a lot. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's basically, it comes down to, uh, you know, 
saying we use, you know, the best encryption possible to protect you from privacy, you know, to protect your privacy with your tax documents and your baby photos and, and, and you know, the, those, the sorts of things that are important to you, it cuts both ways. Us saying that we can't access your data means we can't access your data. And, and that means that we don't know what people are storing. Um, in terms of, in terms of um, you know, where that file is stored, because of the Reed Solomon, no, there there isn't a place where the file is stored in its entirety anywhere. It's broken up with this mathematical trick after being encrypted and then stored uh, in little tiny pieces uh, across all these nodes. Um, I think it was either Sean or, or Ben, our, our CEO, who said that we're, I think it was Sean, I, don't, I guess I don't remember. Um, so, someone said we're, what we're doing is we're making uh, encrypted sand and spreading it across an encrypted you node. Know, what, how even what even is a file? Like it's just, it's all math. And then from this math, you're able to get back your data. Yeah, I think John John said that one, John Quinn. Oh, John, John. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, uh, he loves that analogy. It's, but it's yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, there's, there's many different aspects to that. Um, but we really want to be a platform um, that, that gives users, uh, you know, control over their data. Um, and where, you know, the, the data is encrypted, the users have the keys, you know, where, um, you know, we have a breach or get hacked, like, it doesn't matter, because uh, we don't have access to any of the data, um, which is a very different uh, sense from, you know, many other, um, you know, cloud storage providers where um, someone could get access to that data, whether it's just a malicious entity or, you know, a government. Um, I mean, we, we know the, the stories of, you know, how the, the FBI wanted, you know, backdoors and, and data from Apple and other companies. And, you know, we, we take a very different approach, right, is that we want to have a, a secure platform at its base. We, you know, open source uh, all our code so you can verify that there's no, nothing fishy going in there. Uh, and, and we just kind of want to be kind of the neutral you know, Sweden, you know, data providers that, you know, does, you know, our best job to, to protect you and your data. Um, and, and like JT said, you know, sometimes that, that uh, cuts both ways, but, you know, we really want to be on the side of, of our users and our customers first. Um, yeah, that's great. So speaking of users, and I, I, I know we're running a little long here, but I have actually two more questions I'd like to bring up. Um, we can be brief about this. How do you see people integrating your system with decentralized applications, specifically Ethereum smart contracts? Ooh, that's, that's a good question. So um, like we said before, there, um, you know, our focus right now is, is more in terms of the uh, traditional cloud platform, you know, that, already exists and people use at scale. Uh, but we do have uh, many other people that are, you know, in the build stages of their technology that are looking to use us as, as a kind of distributed uh, data platform like um, Doc AI is one, SonM is another. Um, and so these are, you know, still in the very early stages of their development process, but a lot of people are looking to use us as kind of that, that data layer for applications. Um, I've seen, you know, a couple of examples of people who have built distributed applications, um, adding in air quotes here, and, you know, the, the application will be running and then suddenly, uh, which, you know, happens every couple of years, you know, Amazon S3 will go down and take a quarter of the internet with it and uh, that application as well. And everyone's just like, oh, why did this decentralized and distributed application, you know, uh, go down? And then you realize, oh, they were just storing all of the data on a centralized, um, you know, cloud storage provider. So um, we're a really, you know, useful platform for kind of these distributed uh, and decentralized applications, but it's still, still very, very early. Uh, in terms of the development. So a lot of people are integrating and, and learning the tool sets and building their platforms, but uh, I think it's it's a bit, it's very early on uh, in the stage of development. 
Yeah, so specifically, one of the useful things about IPFS is, is content addressed, and I can fit that content address within a 256-bit register in the EVM. Mm -hmm. um, is there an analogous thing that I could do with that on, on storage? Yeah, so hypothetically, you know, in terms of that example, you could, um, since there's a lot of integrations with IPFS already, uh, you could just essentially use storage as a backend uh, for IPFS, and then you would be able to reuse some of those same integrations and you'd have some guarantee that the, the files would be available in there and they would just be stored on storage. So um, cool. you can use kind of existing layers um, to essentially, um, you know, kind of have your cake and eat it too. If that, yeah, because it feels like IPFS effective. is becoming kind of like an open standard um, almost, but de facto, I guess you could call it, IPNS specifically. So Building that wrapper, like you said earlier, would be extremely valuable to anybody because really what you are is a backend for the storage mechanism and the addressing system should be independent of that to some degree. Yeah, we, uh, we have, um, if people are interested in contributing to our platform, some of our open tickets are descriptions of the IPFS gateway that we have planned. Um, it's not on our immediate roadmap for our next release, but um, an IPFS gateway um, in a, a number of different directions actually is something that we are very interested in doing. Yeah, I mean, that's the cool thing about, um, you know, distributed systems and open source, right? You, you have all these, you know, cool projects in the space um, like IPFS or, or Filecoin and, you know, we're really trying to make a dent, um, you know, a bit for ideological reasons and, you know, the, the large cloud providers, Amazon, you know, Google, Microsoft, and we're, we're kind of all idealistically aligned to, to um, you know, store people's data in a, in a better way, more secure way, more private way, more performant way. Um, but, you know, all this code is open source. And so if we can write, you know, integrations and, and tools together uh, to, to really uh, have a, a unified uh, front in code against these, you know, large providers who, you know, exist and people use, but, you know, maybe not have all the, the interest and heart uh, uh, and the focus on the users that these platforms, you know, the platforms that we and others in, in the space are trying to build right. uh, that really think of the users first. So, so I guess the last thing I, I we've kind of skirted past this issue and you've mentioned it a few times and I feel like it's something that does, does deserve at least a few sentences on you say people get paid. What does that mean? So if I'm using your service, I'm getting paid for putting up a node. What is your, what is your model for that? Just, just to clarify for that for the audience. You want me to take this one or you want to take it, JT? Oh, no, no, go ahead. That's that's what you've been working on. <laughs> yeah, so the, the basic, you know, premise uh, that, that makes this work is, you know, people have extra, you know, hard drive space uh, on their computer um, that they're not using and they, you know, already have a stable internet connection. Um, and so they could, you know, download this uh, program, you know, take a, a few minutes to set it up and just hit go and let it let it run in the background um, and earn money for uh, storing that data over time and serving uh, that data when requested. Um, so users are essentially getting paid um, our native token uh, storage, S-T-O-R-J, um, for essentially providing you know, hard drive uh, space and bandwidth. Um, so it's, it's kind of variable what they would earn uh, based on uh, you know, the, the stability and uptime of their node, how much, you know, data they're storing, how much bandwidth uh, that uh, they're providing. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, we're, we're you know, providing incentive uh, and a direct incentive for, for people to, to rent out their hard drive space and actually, you know, have some benefit uh, for them, uh, you know, participating in this network, which, you know, incentives make things, make things work. Um, and so that's really important. This is a departure for some, you know, other, um, you know, cloud storage platforms, distributed cloud storage platforms in, in the past where um, people have said, okay, you know, if you share out your space, we'll give you more space on that network, uh, on, on this network. And that's just kind of, if you have apples and you, you know, someone trades you more apples, you know, you don't, you don't come out any better, but if you can, you know, take those apples and, you know, trade them for, you know, something of, of some tangible value, um, then, you know, it works out a lot better. So, um, 
highly variable in terms of um, you know, what you can make based on kind of your setup and your node. But um, it, at the end of the day, it's it's going to be a market um, for for people uh, to participate in. I think that's a great way to wrap this episode up. As always, I'd like to ask our, our guests: is is there something that we should have asked you, or you hoped we asked you that we didn't get around to? No, I mean, personally, I thought this was a great conversation. I, wonderful questions. Very, very insightful. I, I appreciated the conversation. Yeah, it was great. Uh, I, I would like to highlight one thing. I, I'd, I really recommend uh, your, your listeners to go to storage.io, S-T-O-R-J.io, and take a look at the white paper, um, become a storage node operator, and uh, play around with our, our tools and library, or maybe make some uh, contributions towards that uh, IPFS gateway we talked about. So uh, plenty of stuff for people to look around and do if uh, you didn't get enough uh, during this uh, conversation. Outstanding. Cool. We'll put those links Thanks, in, our, in our show notes and uh, I'm happy to have you all on. Uh, as always, as, um, if you like this episode, audience, please link it, share it on Twitter, share it on whatever media platform you, you enjoy yourself. Uh, contact us, join the Slack and tell us what we what you liked, what you didn't like, anything. Just uh, share it as much as possible so people can understand a little bit more about how distributed storage or decentralized storage works, what, why it's useful, and how storage is, is solving that issue. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and, and maybe in a couple always, months, you yeah. guys will be storing your data on, on storage yep. as well. <laughs> so, yeah, and then also, as always, follow us on Twitter at hashingitoutpod. And Corey is at Corpetti, and I am at Colin Couchet. That's C O L L I N C U S C E. Thanks, guys. It's a great, great episode.